His shoulders were aching. He was tired. <laughs> he just wanted to go to bed. Been awake more than 24 hours and spent the entire night fishing and zip and catch a thing. And we see him here on the shore in his boat just cleaning his nets. They're trammel nets. And he's taking all the seaweed out of them because if it dries, it's just almost impossible. And meanwhile, Jesus is teaching and he gets backed up to the sea. <laughs> Rather than getting pushed in, he hops in the boat and asks if Simon could push off a little bit. Simon would rather say, no, I want to go to bed, but he backs up. Jesus finishes teaching. And before Simon can say anything, Jesus turns to him and said, hey, let's push out into the deeper water and do some fishing. A yeah, rough paraphrase. Simon says, Lord, we have fished all night. We haven't caught a thing. He, he's trying to say, Lord, I don't want to do that. This isn't a good idea, but it's Jesus. And so he thought, you know, I'll just give him enough information that he'll say, oh, oh well, okay, I guess I don't know much about fishing. <laughs> yeah. So he says that, and Jesus just says, So Peter says, but because you say so, we'll go. Powerful sentence. But because you say so. Peter just wanted to go to bed. But because you say so. Have you already discovered in following Jesus that there are times he asks you to do things that you think, Really? That can't be the Lord. I, that was the cheese I had last night that's not agreeing with. I, that's, but it won't let you go. Have you noticed this? And when he does, if we're smart, we say the same words. But because you say so. He might say, you know, this family is hurting and I want you to take this many dollars, put an envelope, slip it on the door. And, and you say, well, Lord, we're hurting. <laughs> but because you say so. He might say, this person needs a phone call. And you say, Lord, that person doesn't like me. But because you say so. So they go out and they don't go terribly far when Jesus says, fine, here's good. Throw your nets here. And so Peter and another guy on the boat, they throw the nets, and he leans up against the rail. And his whole body language, his whole face says, oh, let's get this over with. I want to go to bed. And he waits, and he doesn't wait long when there's a bump, and then all of a sudden, boom, the, the nets just pull away. It almost jerks his, his, his shoulder out of its socket. And he sees fish, and, and as they begin to pull the nets, more fish jump in. He calls another boat, says, come help us, his partner's boat. And they pull this net in, and they put the fish in these two boats. And the Bible says in Luke 5 that the, the, the boats were in danger of sinking. This was no small catch. This was the largest catch ever on the Sea of Galilee. I, I've been in these boats that, that have been made, you know, to specifications, you know, that they really believe this is what these boats looked like 2,000 years ago. And, and to fill them up to, to the point where they're in danger of, of sinking is an, an unbelievable amount of fish. Two boats. Now... One of the problems with knowing scripture is you know what Peter does next, right? Most of you. Some might not. Some might just be new to faith, and we're so glad you're here. And, and in this instance, it's good you don't know. I mean, you'll be able to enjoy this. <laughs> but, but I'm going to ask you if you know what Peter does next, just to suspend that. And, and let's talk about what he might could have done. 
You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is he begins to celebrate, right? I mean, jump up and down, fist bump one another. You know, just hooray for our team. This is, this is the cash cow. We just hit the mother load, right? But he doesn't celebrate. Well, I think of another thing to do would be to come up next to Jesus and say, uh, when do you want to go fishing again? <laughs> this works. Hey, you know, there's a figure in our culture that is iconic. And even if you don't watch the show, you all know who Barney Fife is, right? He could have done a Barney Fife, hitched both thumbs in his belt. <sighs> Well, I guess some of us know how to fish, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't take credit. He doesn't celebrate. He doesn't try to arrange another thing. What's he do? He falls to his knees. And now he's up over his waist in slimy, flopping fish. And he looks at Jesus and he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I mean, this catch of fish was so unbelievable. It's, it's like an insurance lady that's about to be fired for, you know, terrible production who, who went out on a Wednesday morning and sold $100 million worth of insurance. It's like the ninth batter on the worst baseball team in the major leagues hitting five grand slams. The most grand slams ever hit in a game are, are two Seven players have done that. The most RBIs ever hit in a game are 12, 17 players out of the 19,000 that have played Major League Baseball for 150 years. Nobody's hit five grand slams, but this guy does. That's what this, that's what this catch is like. And rather than celebrate, rather than arrange another fishing trip, rather than take the credit, he falls to his knees. In an utter humility, he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Now, now I think what went into this day um, wasn't just serendipitous. In other words, I don't think it just kind of happened. I, I think Jesus kind of set this up to see what Peter's made of. He's choosing disciples, and he wants Peter to be one of the main dudes. And he needs to know that this guy is capable of allowing the Lord to use him without him taking the credit. And so when he falls on his knees and says, depart from me, that's music to Jesus' ears. They, they, they take the ships, they, they land them on shore, and Jesus said to them, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they leave the boats. They leave them. The greatest catch ever, they leave it. And they follow Jesus. For the next three years, Peter walks with Jesus. And, and he was growing, and largely he did great things. You know, when, when Jesus walked on the, on the surface of the sea, and, and the disciples thought they were going to drown. They, they thought that Jesus was an apparition. They, they thought he was the angel of death coming. Jesus assured them, it's me. And Peter says, well, tell me to walk to you. And Jesus says, well, come. Peter gets down and he begins to walk on the water. Now, you know he sinks, right? He starts to pay attention to the wind and the waves. And he, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he sinks. But he's the only guy that got out of the boat. Why do we criticize him? The other guys are in the boat. He's the only guy that's ever walked the surface of, uh, of the sea. Another time, Jesus said to his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And some said, well, some think you're Elijah, and some think you're John the Baptist brought back to life. He said, well, yeah, but who do you think I am? <laughs> to which Peter said, you're the Messiah. The son of the most high God. That's right. Drop down a paragraph, though, and Jesus is talking about the fact that he's going to have to suffer and die. And, and Peter says, no, 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 not, not you. To which Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. 
A moment ago, he praised them. Now he's saying, get behind me, Satan. You know, one of the things about Peter and about you and about me is Jesus doesn't see us as we are. He he sees us for who we can become. He sees us for who we will be. Last week, we told a story about the the Last Supper. Jesus broke the bread. He washed the feet. And it went over their heads because Luke's gospel says that they, they broke into a dispute about who was the greatest. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood spilled for you. I'm the greatest. I mean, they just didn't get it. And Jesus said, before this night is over, you're all going to run. You'll all deny me. And Peter says, no, 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 Lord. No, maybe these yahoos might. Uh, Rough paraphrase. But I won't. I'll never deny you. Oh, is that so? That's right. I won't. Well, Peter, as a matter of fact, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times this night. Lord. They leave that place. They go through a vineyard. They go to a garden where Jesus prays. They go deeper in the garden. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and says, stay awake with me, pray with me. My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. And you unpack the original language there, and it it just talks about a dark, depressive state. And three times he comes back to them, and three times they're sleeping. Finally, he says, wake up. My accuser's here, and here comes Judas. Judas plants a kiss on Jesus. The soldiers begin to make for him. Peter, wanting to be faithful, pulls out a little dagger and lunges at a guy. The guy moves his head just at the last moment and he slices his ear off. Jesus picks up the ear, puts it on his head quickly, heals him. He said, put away your swords. And then he offers his wrist while all the disciples run. They all run. Every one of them runs. And they get a little bit of a distance, and they look back, and they see him getting wrapped in chains as he limps and walks away. They had never seen Jesus like this. This is not how it's supposed to go down. They had this all planned out. They knew that Jesus was about to come into his kingdom. And that he was going to establish his kingdom on earth. And they were going to get thrones alongside of him. In fact, what they were arguing about is who was going to get the right one and the left one right next to Jesus. They knew this was going to happen. And so this threw them into an unbelievable state of cognitive dissonance. I mean, they they, they just couldn't believe this was happening. Peter kind of circled back around and found where Jesus was. In fact, John was in the courtyard and he talked to some servants and let Peter in. And now it's the middle of the night and they can hear what's going on because the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin was meeting And uh, they were accusing Jesus. And, 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 And Peter could hear this. He heard him slapped. He heard his groans as his beard was pulled out. About this time, a a little girl, a little kitchen maid said, hey, You're one of that man in there's disciples, aren't you? He said, no, 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 I don't don't know who that is. Jesus now comes out as the high court is deliberating. and Jesus is there with some soldiers, and Peter can see him. He's He's got a mask or blindfold on, and they're hitting him upside the head. They said, prophesy, who hit you that time, O great king? 
Peter looks at this. He thinks, this, this can't be. This isn't who I have followed for three years. This isn't what's supposed to happen. He thinks, was there a, a limit to how long his power would last? Is three years all up and, and, and now he has no more? He's exhausted and maybe his mind begins to play tricks on him. Maybe some of those miracles weren't what we thought they were. Because this makes no sense. Another person comes and says, you're one of his disciples. No, I'm not. Finally, a third comes. Matthew's gospel says not only does he deny that he knows Jesus, it says he calls curses down on his own head. Very dangerous thing. Waiting for its cue off stage, the rooster now crows. Jesus looks up, Peter looks at him. Peter realizes even though he was told what would happen, and even though Peter said it never would happen, it happened. And he ran. And he didn't come back. Jesus went through a kangaroo court, was sentenced to die. Peter wasn't at the cross. When Jesus breathed his last, Peter was nowhere to be found. But we do know that on Sunday morning, that we celebrate as Easter Sunday, some ladies rapped at the door. Peter was there with the disciples. The lady said, we don't know what happened. We don't know who took him or where his body is, but he is missing. James begins to run. Peter tries to catch up. I mean, John, rather. And Peter tries to catch up. John gets to the tomb first, but being rather young, he's, he's frightened to go in. Peter comes, and he just runs right in, and he examines the grave cloths. And he, he doesn't know what to make of it. I love what I read in Mark's gospel. It records the angels saying to the ladies, go tell Peter and the disciples to meet him in Galilee. I love what the men uh, that were working, uh, walking on the road to Emmaus said when, when Jesus um, broke bread and they realized it was Jesus and then he disappeared and, and they ran the seven miles back into Jerusalem, burst into that room with all those disciples and they said, he's alive and he's shown himself to Peter. <laughs> John 21 is a, is a gem. John is the only one that records this last episode. and I believe John 21 is in the Bible to, to show the veracity of the resurrection. Some have said, oh, you know, they were just hallucinating. This was just wishful thinking. No, it wasn't. Jesus is on the shore. The disciples are out fishing. In fact, John 21 begins with Peter saying, I'm going fishing. About seven disciples join them. And, and commentators are split as to what that means. Some believe Peter was saying, I know how to fish. That's what I've done all my life. I'm not really cut out to be a disciple. I, I failed too badly. I'm of no use to him. I'm going back to fishing. Others thought he's just biding his time. Don't know. But we do know they had fished all night and caught nothing. When morning comes, there's a, there's a solitary figure on the shore, and the boat's not too terribly far out, and they can see one another, but they can't make out who one another are because of the mist coming off the water. And the man on the shore, who is Jesus, yells out and says, children, have you caught any fish? And they yell back, no. And he says, well, throw your nets on the other side, and they do. And instantly, the net is filled with 153 large fish, which is an interesting thing, because the Bible doesn't list things for 
no reason. So what's the significance of 153? And there's been all kinds of theories, you know. One of them says that there was 153 different kinds of fish in the sea, and they all jumped in. I don't know. <laughs> when we get to heaven, we'll find out why he said 153. Well, anyways, John saddles up next to Peter, and he says, that's the Lord. And Peter says, yeah. Peter whips off his outer clothing, and he swims ashore. And then when the boat gets close enough, Peter wades out and drags the boat and brings it in with all these fish. And Jesus said, bring some of those fish here. Cleans them, roasts them, eats them with them, which is a lesson all by itself that we don't have time to get into. And when the meal is done, Jesus turns to Peter, but he doesn't call him Peter. Interestingly, he calls him his formal name that he hasn't referred to him this way since the first chapter in John 1, when he called him Simon, son of John. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, in our language, we have uh, one word for love. It's love. <laughs> but in the Greek, there are several words. The strongest of which is agape, which is a sacrificing, it's a self-denying, it's a go to the mat and not let go love. It's unconditional. And so when uh, Jesus says to Simon, son of John, do you love me? He, he's saying, do you agape me? Do you love me with that kind of love? Peter responds, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you. But the word he uses is phileo. It's, it's a brotherly kind of love. Uh, our city, Philadelphia, phileo, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. It, it's a familial love. It, it's how you love somebody in your family, but it's, it doesn't have near the strength or depth that agape does. Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. He says, do you love me more than these? And some have thought he's referring to the disciples. Others have thought he's referring to all the accruedments of fishing. Do you love me more than this? So he asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. There's a humility here. This is Peter who beat his chest to say the last time, they're going to have to go over my dead body to get to you, Jesus. And he caved like a wet napkin. And he's not going to do that again. He has enough presence of mind and enough self-understanding. He thinks, I can't brag like that anymore. I, I don't know if I can do that. Lord, I phileo you. Jesus says the third time, Simon, son of John. And some commentators think he, he was referring back to that name. He's taking him all the way back to the beginning. But he's also taking him back to his family and says, you know, I, I want... I want this sin to be behind you because it's a, it's a sin on your family too. But the third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? And, and so Jesus shifts and Jesus steps down to the level that Peter was at. Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo you. And for the third time, he says, good, feed my sheep. I love what's happening here. The, the fire Jesus built here on this shore was a charcoal fire. The fire that was in the courtyard where he denied him three times was also a charcoal fire. I mention that because the Bible does. It's only twice that the peculiar Greek word for charcoal fire is found in the entire New Testament. Once in the courtyard, once on this beach. I don't think it's by accident. And Jesus is saying to Peter, you're a shepherd. 
I've called you to feed sheep. But you are stuck in your failure. You are stuck in your past. You can't get beyond it, but you've got to because I've called you to feed sheep. There's people you can't even imagine. There's, there's continents on this globe that you don't even know exist. There's generation of men and women that, that are yet to be born, and I need you to feed them, to shepherd them. But you're not there because you are dwelling in the past. And, and his going through this elaborate means is, is just math. Around a charcoal fire, Peter denied him three times. And around a charcoal fire, Jesus gives him the chance to confess him three times. Negative three, positive three equals zero. Let's get started again. He's saying to Peter, would you get over it? I forgave you. You are mine. We've got work to do, work that cannot be done if you stay in the past. Let's feed sheep. That helps me. I bet it helps you too, doesn't it? Who here hasn't done some stupid things, right? Who here hasn't done some things that you think, oh, Lord, what was I thinking? In, in fact, there's some people right here, right now, that this is on your mind. Not too long ago, you did something or something happened to you, and you can't get beyond it. You try to sleep and the memory comes back and you, you grab your bed sheets till your knuckles turn white and you sit up and you say, why? Right? And I believe he's got more forgiveness than we've got sin. I believe he gets us beyond that. And I believe that if you're stuck there, you don't need to be stuck there. He's got work for you to do. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. We're not quite done. We're almost. I've got another prayer concern here in a moment. But if I've just described you, I'm going to ask you to just be honest. And you're kind of living in the past and you're thinking, I, I, I blew it. Or this happened, and I, I, I don't know how to process this. I, I don't know if I can be used again. I, I, I don't know. The good news is we have a gracious Savior who forgives. You know, he saw Peter not for who he was, but for who he could be. He sees you. Not for who you are, but who you will be. If I've just described you and you, you, you've got this something, and, and we don't need to know what it is, but it, it has tethered you to the past, and you can't seem to get beyond it. I, I know this is courageous to ask of you, but if that's you and you want to get past it, no one's looking around right now. I want to pray with you, and I, I want you just to stand if I've just described you. If that's you, sure, 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 absolutely, sure, yep, who else, who else? My Father in heaven, I lift up to you precious people that you love and people you died for. And I pray now that in the name and power of Jesus, your love and your grace and your forgiveness will flow. will wash them clean. Though their sin be as crimson, would it be whiter than snow? I pray that you will remind them that you are not done with them, that you see them beyond where they are, 
and beyond who they are. I pray. I pray that your Holy Spirit would bear witness to their spirit. It's something fundamental has changed in their composition, that they are forgiven. They are free. And if the memory comes back, they can say to the enemy, back off. That's forgiven. And I pray this, Father, in the name and in the power of Jesus. Have a seat, friends. Everybody look back up here. Got one more thing. They now begin to walk. And Jesus says to Peter, when you were young, you dressed the way you wanted to dress and you went where you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will be dressed in a fashion that you don't want to be dressed and you will be led where you don't want to go. John adds the commentary that says, Jesus said this to describe to Peter how he was going to be martyred, how he was going to glorify Christ in his death, which means that John lived to see that. And to show that Peter yet had some growing to do, he sees out of the corner eye, he sees John walking up, and he says, well, how about him? Which kind of unpacks a little something. There probably was a little something between Peter and John. That might have been the nucleus of who's the greatest around here. Don't know. Well, what about him? To which Jesus responds in a beautiful way that is so wonderful. He says this, if I want him to remain until I return, what is that to you? What is that to you? Five words. Take the first letter, W-I-T-T-Y. What is that to you? The witty principle. (laughs) And it's this. God has no favorite sons. God does not love the person next to you or down the street from you or somebody in your office more than you. God is writing a story in your life. And it's one of love. He loves nobody else more than you. As a matter of fact, he loves you as much as he loves his own son, Jesus. John 17, right around verse 23. May they be brought to complete unity, Father, so that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them even as you love me. Jesus' words, you love them even as you love me. He loves you. He doesn't have a favorite son. But we compare ourselves to one another all the time. Somebody's your age, they got the same education as you. And they've, they've gone so much farther than you've gone, and you've thought, what am I, chopped liver, why? Somebody has seven healthy kids, and you've got three, and they're all sick, and you're taking them to doctors and hospitals, and you think, oh, God, you've blessed that family, but not mine. Obviously, you love them more than you love me. That's not true. He's writing a story in their lives. He's writing a story in your life. He loves you. When we compare ourselves to one another, we lose, period. You can't win. You can't win. We were never meant to. 
Here's where we're going to pray again. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Maybe this is something that is going on in your heart. You're saying, Lord, you don't, you don't love me as much as you love. Or why have you abandoned me? Or why have you forsaken me? I don't know. But if that's you, I wonder if in obedience you would stand. And let's just get that behind you. Would you? Who's there? Say, yeah, I, I've compared and I got to quit it. Sure, sure. Who else? Sure. Who else? Sure. Mm -hmm. Who else? All right, good. One more. I'm going to wait for one more. Who else? Great. Great. Father, you see these who are standing. And I pray now in the name and the power of our risen Savior that you will bring forgiveness and renewal and the assurance of your, your great love for them. That you are writing their life story on their own hearts. I pray that when they sit down and when they go home, this is behind them. I pray in the name of Jesus. Have a seat. Somebody came up after the first service and said, you know what, you would do us a favor if you would have a third group, and the third group would consist of those who didn't stand for one of the two before but should have. But okay, so bow your heads. Anybody like that? I should have stood. I didn't stand, but I should have. Anybody? I see that. I got you. I got you, dude. I love you. Who else? I see that. Who else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Very quickly, anybody else? Father, you know what's going on in our friends' lives. And I pray in the name and power of Jesus Christ that your forgiveness flows. I pray that you would defeat the work of the enemy in their hearts, that they would not be played by our enemy. They would know freedom. I pray you'd do a new thing. And assure them that their prayer has been heard. That they are loved by you as much as you love Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a seat. Jesus didn't see Peter for who he was. He saw him for who he could be. And years and years later, when Peter was an old man, Persecution, and this is apocryphal. We don't know this for sure. This isn't biblical. It's a story that's been handed down through the ages, largely believed to be true. When persecution was breaking out in Rome, Peter, now an elderly man, was led out of the city by his young disciples. And as he was leaving the city, coming into the city was Jesus. And he said, Lord, what are you doing? And Jesus says, well, I'm, I'm going to be crucified again. And Peter said, not so. And Peter turned and went back into the city. And when they were about to crucify him, he said, you know, I don't deserve to be crucified in a manner that Jesus was. Would you crucify me upside down? And they did. And the man that Jesus saw as he was up to his waist in slimy, flopping fish, became the man at the end that glorified him. He sees the same in you. He sees you for who you can become. 
which is good news. Do you stand for a benediction? And I'll tell you, if you want to come down and pray after what you've heard, or if you've got something you need to pray about, you want somebody to pray with you, we're, we're free to do that. If this is the time you need to turn your life over to the Lord, we can pray with you. My Father in heaven, I thank you for these, my friends, that I love and you love so much more. I pray that you dismiss them with great grace. Walk with them this week. Would they know the joy of your great approval and love? And would you help us to increasingly become more like Jesus? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, friends. You're dismissed.